I remember saying to the producers, Suellen has had too many affairs and she's had too many years of drinking. I would like her to stop. And they said, <laughs> patronizingly so, but you do it so well. That first audition, um, I remember it very, very clearly because I was doing a series with Norman Lear called All the Glitters. And Ruth Comforte, who was the casting lady, um, was asked to, to cast these very small characters on a new series called Dallas. And uh, she called them about me and she said, uh, I'd like Linda Gray to come in. And they were like, who? We don't know. And we have someone else in mind. And um, we already were kind of very close to making an offer. She said, well, before you do, please, 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 please see her. So I got an audition at 5 o'clock on Friday, which is death. <laughs> you know, going up at 5 o'clock. Nobody's interested. They're all looking at their watches. They want to go home. So um, there was no dialogue for Sue Ellen. So they wrote me an audition um, phone call. And it was Sue Ellen's side of a phone conversation. J.R. was calling her uh, to tell her that, he was so sorry he couldn't be home for John Ross's birthday party because he was busy at the office. Well, we know about JR. He wasn't at the office. Anyway, so um, I did this monologue, one way conversation. And the most interesting thing was that I knew in that room, I knew that I got that job. And oddly enough, it was my friend who was, they were considering for the role. Uh, it was Mary Fran who ended up being Bob Newhart's wife, thank God. <laughs> you know, I love Mary. Mary and I were dear friends. I didn't really know it at the time that she was the one. But um, uh, there I was, and I, I was walking to my car, and I thought, I've got this job. It was odd. It was the oddest feeling. It was a woman's intuition. It, it was something. But I felt it. It was palpable, and I knew. And I walked to the car, and I thought, wow, this is really interesting. But I have this job. And um, then it wasn't too long after that I got the phone call that I did actually have it. Well, I still, to this day, I feel that Sue Ellen Ewing was the most interesting female on television in the 80s. Um, because of that, because Dallas was, uh, was a forerunner. Uh, we brought out issues, bigger than life, of course, but we brought out issues when Miss, Miss Ellie had a um, mastectomy. Uh, and Sue Ellen had the drinking problem. Um, it was, when Betty Ford started the Betty Ford Clinic. It was at a time where society was changing. Uh, things were no longer pushed under the rug. There were no 800 numbers at that time um, where people could call and get help. It was, you know, if you, if you drank, that was acceptable. Uh, drugs were certainly not, but people tried to uh, do the best they could. And instead of talking to a therapist, if you went to a therapist, you were considered crazy. And uh, so people just sort of quietly, they didn't know what to do. So women drank, men drank. <laughs> a lot, you saw a lot of that on Dallas. But um, th those issues were brought up on Dallas, which I found was absolutely fascinating and dealt with. The issues were brought up. And uh, I remember going to the producers and saying, uh, I'm really tired of Sue Ellen drinking and having affairs. Um, and society was changing. You know, women were getting their lives together. They were speaking up for themselves. Um, they were wanting to do things other than uh, what society had uh, placed upon them, the titles that they had said, well, you can do this and you can do that. And women were going, you know what? I want to do this and I want to do that and I don't have to necessarily be what you uh, think and say and feel that I should be. So women were getting, becoming their own people their own person. They were uh, embracing that part of themselves that they hadn't really done before. Well, I think it's when you're an actor, you are playing that role. You know, that, that is a role that you're playing. But I also looked at Dallas as, uh, because it was such a global success, uh, that there were, you know, people were looking. I, have, I had letters that were so amazing to me. People joining AA because of that, people leaving their abusive husbands because of the show. Now, we didn't do that on purpose, but I think sometimes when people see uh, a situation 
on screen that they're not able to maybe verbalize or they've never really thought about. It's like, ooh, maybe I do have a drinking problem. Maybe my husband is abusive, that maybe I should do something about this situation. Um, when they see that, uh, they're able to step up and say, I need help. And uh, so that's what I thought was fabulous about our show. I did. I was very, very pleased with the way they developed Sue Ellen. Um, but because it was a very, um, it was a very interesting, uh, complex, complicated show, and the complex, and, and Sue Ellen was so complex and complicated and dysfunctional. Uh, but my whole feel, feeling was it was all about the relationships, and I knew innately, intuitively, that when an actor gets bored with a character, you can feel it as an audience. You know, when you go to a, a theater and you take yourself out of the, your home and you choose to see a movie, uh, you're, you know, that's somebody for two hours. You know they're playing a role, etc. When someone is in your living room or your kitchen or your bedroom, week after week after week, but years and years and years, that's a, that's a different scenario. It's a whole, a whole different thing that happens. So I do feel that there's a responsibility. So I remember saying to the producers, Sue Ellen has had too many affairs and she's had too many years of drinking. I would like her to stop. And they said, <laughs> patronizingly so, but you do it so well. <laughs> I said, thanks. <laughs> thanks a lot. I think I'll accept the compliment. But I would like her to move on. It's time because as an actor on board, and I don't want that to be visual to the audience. I respect and love the audience. Uh, bless them for watching. So I really want to take her to another level. They weren't real thrilled with that. They didn't want to do that. And uh, so I kept, kept it up, <laughs> Sue Ellen. And finally they said, you know, okay, but if, we, if you stop the drinking, we're gonna take you down. And I said, how far down? They said, you're going down. I said, okay, let's do it. And that's when I got to totally chew the scenery and, and uh, you know, take her down. And uh, that's what I loved. I mean, I loved those, uh, those scenes where I really, uh, you know, you saw all, all the, the Sue Ellen, warts and all, you saw, you saw her, at her at her lowest. And uh, I thought, people need to see this. They need to see that, uh, you know, this could happen to them. She was finding her way. She started her own business. Um, and, and because of their relationship, uh, she was able to learn a lot of business things that went on. Certainly not all, everything. But, uh, you know, she knew. She knew how business uh, played out. She knew how to begin it. She had money. Um, and she had a vision. And I think a lot of, a lot of women in that position um, you know, but they would see Sue Ellen starting a lingerie business and say, wait a minute, I could start my own business. I could do something like that. I don't have to just be in this particular role. So I think that was another uh, way of, of uh, putting out to, uh, to the world that, you know, it, you, you have an idea, you have a vision, a passion for a particular um, area. Uh, do it. Try it. So I think that Sue Ellen was kind of a pioneer. I realized that I had a long, long talk with Sue Ellen Ewing when I realized that um, she was coming back and we were actually doing this show again. Because <laughs> two years ago, we all got a phone call, Patrick, Larry, and I saying, would you be interested if we did a series again? And we all said, of course. And uh, that was two years ago. And then we never heard another word. We were like, oh, good idea, but <laughs> what happened? So anyway, when we got this call that it was actually for real, we were so, so excited. I mean, it was, it was, it was a gift, uh, very surreal to come back. But I, I thought, wow, Sue Ellen's been off camera for a long time, uh, and life has moved on. Where, where would she be? Who would she be now? 20 years has passed. Where in the world would Sue Ellen Ewing be right now? So I took Sue Ellen out to lunch. We had a loud chat. Then <laughs> I took her for long walks, several long walks. I said, okay, girlfriend, where would you be 20 years later? And what a gift for an actor to be able to play that role again, um, but still a little scary, 
a little intimidating. <laughs> it's like, oh boy, oh boy, come on, Swillin, let's dust you off and fluff your hair up and um, get you ready. So um, I had this, I, I really had long, long, long chats with myself and uh, talked to Swillin and said, okay, where would, you, where would we be now? And uh, let's, let's talk about that. So uh, when I found out that Cynthia Cidre uh, wrote this, uh, wrote the pilot and was the executive producer, I was beyond thrilled because it was a woman. And uh, Dallas had a few women writers, but not a lot. Uh, so for me, it was, it, it was a joy. It was another blessing to be able to sit down with a woman and say, here's where I think Sue Ellen would be 20 years later. And um, I, I knew a lot about Dallas women. I have a lot of uh, women friends here in Texas. And so, um, I started bringing and putting all the pieces together, what I thought, what society was doing, um, all kinds of wonderful things. Start, I started layering a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Where would you be? What would you wear? Where have you traveled? Where, you know, what is life like for you now? And um, I came up with a few ideas and I threw them by Cynthia and uh, we had wonderful dialogue, open dialogue, and she was very open to my ideas. And um, so I think what is transpiring with Sue Ellen is absolutely perfect. You know, it's, those are the things that are hard to explain, to verbalize, they really are. Um, but there was an, there's an instant chemistry that we had. Um, I, I, you know, I can't describe it. It's, uh, it's, it's magical. Um, because when I first met Larry Hagman, he walked into a room in, um, in Burbank, California, and um, it, it was the first time the entire cast got together and we did a table read of the first script. And Sue Ellen had nothing to say. I sort of said, more coffee, JR? Something weird like that, <laughs> something meaningful. Um, anyway, uh, we were sitting at this, uh, we gathered. Larry walked in, cowboy hat, uh, slung over his shoulder. He had a carved um, leather uh, saddlebags over the filled with ice and two bottles of champagne. <laughs> big, big creature that walked in. I mean, it's an awesome, awesome sight. And he looked at me and he went, hello, darling. And I thought, well, this is Major Nelson. <laughs> uh, Major Nelson and the man from Atlantis. I said, what the hell is this, a sitcom? I didn't know. It's, what is this? Where am I? <laughs> the only one for me that had any substance was Barbara Bell Geddes. I thought, okay, all right, there's hope here. Um, but that's what happened. And uh, then we had our first scene together in, um, in Dallas. And uh, we started bickering. And honestly, to this day, to this day, we do that. He'll say, Miss Gray, where did you get that sweater? And I'll say, something, whatever, I bought it. And he, oh, well, did you get it on sale? Or, uh, you know, he'll just, he just does it, and I do it right back. And then people... I mean, whenever, if I haven't seen him for a while and we're, we're together in the same room, he will both start, start with something. And people around go, oh boy, this is like a real J.R. Swellen scene. And you can feel them kind of start backing away. <laughs> it's like, I'm going to throw a bottle at him or something weird's going to happen. I don't know what it is. It's magic. It's that damn twinkle in those blue eyes that gets me every time. I'm kind of a sucker for twinkling kind of magical eyes. I don't know. I'm, I'm, there you go, okay. But I, I don't know. I, I like, see, I love, um, uh, Cary Grant had it, that twinkle. Uh, Larry's got it. Uh, George Clooney has it. Uh, little Hugh Grant. They've got that twinkle, that mischievous something, and Larry's got it. And I'm just like, all right, I'm, I'm there. I'll just play with you. There's a playfulness. It's like, okay, you two are in the, in the sandbox. Just start. And we spar with each other. We're like the old Bickersons, but that dates me. Um, so we, we spar. We're sparring partners is, is a great way to say it. And on screen, it was like, it's kind of, uh, I, I'm going to say the word. It's organic. And I know it sounds it's a little bit used, overused right now. Uh, I don't care. But it just, it, it started in 1978, and this morning we just had a scene still there. So, I mean, how do you describe that? I don't know. <laughs> I think it's because historically all 
films that I remember, were they're all about relationships. And I feel that it was timing, uh, fabulous casting. Uh, people are fascinated by Texas. It was in the 80s, it was the Reagan, Reagan era. It was um, Texas. People are like fascinated, like Giant and Bonanza, all historically people like that big, big stuff, like big hats and big shoulder pads and big earrings and big hair. <laughs> so it's like, wow, and those people have so much money and look at their beautiful cars and their clothes, et cetera, and look at their problems. So I think that people on a given night would come home from work, whatever night we were on in their particular country, uh, they would come home and they want to be entertained. And that's what we love to do. That's our passion. We love to entertain people. So they like to sit down, forget their day-to-day -day troubles and their financial problems and say, oh my God, these people have more money than anybody and look at their problems. Our, our problems are paled by comparison. But it was all, to me, bottom line about relationships and dysfunctional <laughs> at, at best. <laughs> they were crazy, wonderful. And then the men started watching because of the business. Uh, you know, all this intricate, they either had a boss like that or they were like that or they had you know, grandpa or uncle or somebody was like J.R. Ewing, and that fascinated them. It's like, oh, you mean we're not the only people that are uh, not terribly nice in business. So then the men started feeling that this is not a nighttime woman's soap opera, that they were fascinated by the business. So the women were watching, the men were watching, and globally it was all about, again, relationships. That, that's my answer. It was so huge. It was the longest summer ever of one's life. I mean, it was nuts, I thought, please. And there was a writer's strike that sort of came in there too and extended the summer season. It was a nightmare. I couldn't wait for that thing to be on the air because I had recorded, all the trivia people will love this. Um, they'll remember because it was done in voiceover. No one on camera said, Kristen, it was you who shot JR. Where was that done? by me, in a sound booth, on the stage in Culver City. Um, it was done in voiceover. So nobody was on film when that was, I think they were tight on, uh, Chris, on Mary Crosby's face. And in voiceover, Sue Ellen says, Kristen, it was you who shot JR. So, that, so it was all done in the, in, the, in, the sound, in the sound booth. And I did that. So I knew, I knew, <laughs> I knew before anybody. And it was like, oh my God, I, I couldn't, you know, it was a long, holding that secret for a long time was hard. Yeah, I think Larry knew. I think Larry knew because they were offering him a lot of money. They didn't offer me money. <laughs> he has that Midas touch, you know. I think, I think Germany offered him a lot of money. I don't know, Las Vegas was doing bets. It was crazy, crazy time. Marcus Welby was my very first job. I was terrified. I was just terrified, and um, I remember meeting jo uh, James Brolin and, um, and, and Mr. Young. I was j and I sat, and the man who directed it, and oh, I, I can't remember his name. He's the man that directed Shogun, and I can't. I feel terrible. I don't remember his name. Anyway, he came up to me after the scene and he said, uh, "Nice work." He said, uh, "What have I seen you on before?" my first job. <laughs> he was like, <clears throat> thank God I'd already finished my scene and I did a good job. <laughs> so it was like, oh my God, if I'd told him before, he probably would have said, oh, this is not good. Anyway, I was sitting in makeup very, very early in the morning and um, the lady did, that did, was doing my hair, she did it and it didn't look right at all. I hated it. And I remember the man who told me this, Bill Cunningham. Bill Cunningham is a dear agent and he was James Garner and Carol Burnett's agent. And he said, you know what? Don't ever go in front of that camera unless you're happy. Because nobody's going to say, oh, she had a bad hairdresser. They're going to say, your hair looks terrible or your makeup looks terrible. So he said, you must always, before you go on camera, make sure that you're happy. When your character, your, I was a nurse, make sure you're happy. And I wasn't. And it was the first time, because I was very shy. It was my very first job. And I was very shy to tell her. But I did. I spoke up very meekly. Could you make this come again down here like it's a little bit like that's what happened. That was, and it was, a learning, it was a learning experience because I was very young and I didn't want to speak up. But I had to learn that they're not on camera. It's, you're the one that's on camera. So I had to learn. That was on Marcus Welby. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, well, it's so individual. And, uh, you know, I'd been on the set, obviously, with this great crew. And um, I had studied with Lillian Chauvin, a French woman, woman director. And um, so I didn't want to go in and say, may I direct? I didn't want it to be like that. I wanted to come in and say, look, I have studied and prepared and I feel confident and ready uh, to, to direct. I didn't want to be just like, okay, you know, like a, a regular on a, on a hit show and then, okay, I want to direct on board or whatever. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to come in because I really wanted to direct. I wanted, but I didn't want, I wanted to do it well. And so my, my job was to do it well. And I wanted to come in from, from an interesting point of view. And I knew all the characters, I knew all the crew. So that, I had an advantage going in. And uh, it was a little strange uh, directing my fellow actors, and they, my family, you know, it was a little strange. Everyone, they could not have been more supportive and more wonderful. Um, you know, I just wanted to do different things. I knew every, what angles everybody, all the other directors used. So I wanted to do a little different angles. I just, want, like every director, you want to make your little mark, but you can't, you can't mess with the system. So I had to do, I did the best I could and I really enjoyed it. That's what I loved about it. It was, on a, it was just a fabulous workshop for, you know, 11 years. Um, I don't do that. Uh, I don't um, think of something uh, to make me cry. Uh, because I feel, for me, I mean, every actor's different, so it's not about, you know, their method doesn't work. I think it has to be so individual for your, for your particular, uh, who you are, who you are as an individual, uh, translating that into character. Um, for me, I have to be present in the moment and I have to listen. I have to be so present, I have to be in the now, as they say, I have to be right there. And if you listen and you're in the moment, man, that'll trigger, that triggers me uh, because I put myself there. I'm there. I'm not thinking about my dog over here or grandma or something horrible that happened because that, to, for me, takes me over there. I want to be right here. I want to be right with you, locked into your eyes and relating a story. We're all storytellers. And I can't tell a story if I'm thinking of another story over there. So for me, that doesn't work. I can't even record dialogue on a tape recorder for me and listen to it like a lot of people do, a lot of people on the set do. And I can't do that because the way I hear it is the way I'm going to speak it. And in that moment, that may not be the way it's going to come out. So I don't want to do it by road. I don't want to hear it before. I don't want to keep going over and over and over because then that's how I'm going to say it. And if somebody else gives me something else, the way I'm planned to say it isn't going to come out the same. So for me, I have to be right here, right now, right with you. That's it. That's a great, it's a great question, because I've always thought that um, it, it sort of puts, puts, it in, it puts it in a box, pigeonholes that particular um, genre of film. Um, which I, I think is unfortunate. I think it's a little unfair because it's bigger than that. It's, uh, they can call it what they want to call it. It is what it is. But I feel that, that um, it's very convenient for people to put actors, put film genres in a, in a pigeonhole because it makes them feel comfortable. Uh, it's like, oh, that's a soap opera. Close the door. That's this. We, we feel comfortable knowing where every little piece of a film and the actor, everybody get, fits into their little cubby. Um, so I think sometimes it gets a bad, a bad rap where it maybe, I don't know, it's like, what is it? Soap opera, they kind of, it, it connotes daytime, uh, and then they slop it over to nighttime. It doesn't really matter. If it's a good show, I think it, uh, it elevates itself above what, it, what, the, what the word is, soap opera.